let's talk about the law today and let's talk about one of the best books written about the law, written about the legal system in the English language. It's the first book that I read by Charles Dickens and it is one of the most famous books written about the legal system. It's called Bleak House and I would strongly recommend that if you have an interest in law, if you have an interest in reading, if you have an interest in books, if you have an interest in words, then you should read this book. It's a fabulous book and it is one of Dickens' early panoramic novels. But it's about the legal system. It's about the legal system in England and Dickens had a very jaundiced view of the legal system because he had worked as a law clerk, a law writer, in England from a very young age. So he work, worked in the legal profession. He was very familiar with it. And this particular book, Bleak House, is about the legal system. And it's about one particular case, which I'm going to get on to in a minute. But the writing in the book and the description, and the description of London and the legal system and so forth is well worth a listen to. So I'm going to read a section of it now. I'm going to read two sections. I'm going to read the first page or so. And then there's another very, very interesting section which describes what litigation, what legal litigation, legal proceedings are like and what they can be like and how they can go badly wrong for the ordinary person who gets sucked in, dragged in to legal proceedings that may or may not ever end. They appear to be interminable. And I have from time to time met people in my office who are involved in high court proceedings and who, in my view, are not fully aware of how badly the system can sometimes act in allowing people access to justice and outcomes. Anyway, Bleak House, this is the first page. London, Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. Smoke lowering down from chimney pots, making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full-grown snowflakes. Gone into mourning, one might imagine, for the death of the sun. Dogs, undistinguishable in mire. Horses, scarcely better splashed to their very blinkers. Foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas in the general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if this day ever broke. Adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud, sticking at those points tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest. Fog everywhere, fog up the river where it flows among green aits and meadows, fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tears of shipping and the waterside pollutions of a great and dirty city. Fog on the Essex marshes, fog on the Kentish heights, fog creeping into the cabooses of collier brigs, fog lying out on the yards and hovering in the rigging of great ships, fog drooping on the gunwales of barges and small boats. Fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich pensioners, wheezing by the firesides of their wards. Fog in the stem and bowl of the afternoon pipe of the wrathful skipper, down in his close cabin. Fog cruelly pinching the toes and fingers of his shivering little apprentice boy on deck. Chance people on the bridges peeping over the parapets into a nether sky of fog, and with fog all around them, as if they were up in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds. Gas looming through the fog in diverse places in the streets, 
much as the sun may from the spongy fields be seen to loom by husbandman and ploughboy. Most of the shops lighted two hours before their time, as the gas seems to know, for it has a haggard and unwilling look. The raw afternoon is rawest, and the dense fog is densest, and the muddy streets are muddiest, near as that leaden-headed old obstruction, appropriate ornament for the threshold of a leaden-headed old corporation, Temple Bar, and hard by Temple Bar in Lincoln's Inn Hall, at the very heart of the fog, sits the Lord High Chancellor in his High Court of Chancery. The High Court of Chancery then was one of the courts dispensing justice in the uh, legal system in England. The Lord High Chancellor was at the top of the pinnacle of the hierarchy, the leading lawman, the leading law officer in the country. And it says in the book here, at the very heart of the fog sits the Lord High Chancellor. The fog is a metaphor for the legal system. The fog is a metaphor for law and its dispensing in England in the 18, in the 19th century. There's one further passage that I want to read to you. It's a shorter passage. And this gets to the heart of what I'm saying in terms of litigation and the possibility of litigation going badly wrong for the ordinary man or ordinary woman trying to pursue a case in, for example, the High Court on a point of principle. Please listen to this carefully. The name of the case in this book, Bleak House, is Jarndyce and Jarndyce. So, Jarndyce and Jarndyce drones on. This scarecrow of a suit has, in course of time, become so complicated that mo no man alive knows what it means. The parties to it understand it least. But it has been observed that no two chancery lawyers can talk about it for five minutes without coming to a total disagreement as to all the premises. Innumerable children have been born into the cause. Innumerable young people have married into it. Innumerable old people have died out of it. Scores of persons have deliriously found themselves made parties in Jarndyce and Jarndyce without knowing how or why. Whole families have inherited legendary hatreds with the suit. The little plaintiff or defendant who was promised a new rocking horse when Jarndyce and Jarndyce should be settled, has grown up, possessed himself of a real horse, and trotted away into the other world. Fair wards of court have faded into mothers and grandmothers. A long procession of chancellors has come in and gone out. The legion of bills in the suit have been transformed into mere bills of mortality. There are not Three Jarndyces left upon the earth, perhaps since old Tom Jarndyce, in despair, blew his brains out at a coffee house in Chancery Lane. But Jarndyce and Jarndyce still drags its dreary length before the court, perennially hopeless. Jarndyce and Jarndyce has passed into a joke. That is the only good that has ever come of it. That's Jarndyce and Jarndyce. That's the suit. That's the case. It's a probate case and it's to do with a will, and so on and so forth. It's a fabulous book. I'd strongly recommend it. Bleak House, you'll pick it up on, well, you pick it up anywhere. And I'll put a link down below in the description. But the fog in the book is a metaphor for the legal system, and Jarndyce and Jarndyce then is the suit that, which comes into contact, where anybody who comes into contact with it is badly affected by it. And sometimes I mention to people when they come to me for consultation in Enfield and the uh, proceedings or the litigation that they seem to be involved in, I mention Jarndyce and Jarndyce and they look at me blankly because they don't know what I'm talking about. But um, what I mean is that this book, written by a man, Dickens, a genius of a writer, genius of a storyteller, who was very familiar with the legal profession, who worked as a solicitor's clerk, who had a particularly jaundiced view of the legal profession. He describes through the, the vehicle of Jarndyce and Jarndyce, through the vehicle of this chancery suit, the, uh, his uh, jaundiced view as it were of the legal system. 
you have an interest in law, if you have an interest in language, if you have an interest in reading, if you have, if you have an interest in books, then I'd strongly recommend this book, Bleak House. I'll stick a link underneath the, the video. Hope you find this video useful or informative or entertaining or stimulating. And um, if you do, you might give it a thumbs up down below. Thank you.